The opening scene features our protagonist, Michael Schofield, who is getting his body tattooed. Once done, he returns to his apartment and starts ripping all the evidence he researched about various people from Fox River. He also extracts a hard disk from his computer and throws it into a river, ensuring no traces are left behind. The next day, Michael goes to rob a bank with two guns, but as soon as the police arrive, he turns himself in without creating any issue. Following this, he's arrested and sent to the court where his old friend, Veronica Donovan, is serving as his attorney. Surprisingly, he disregards her advice and says that he's ready to go to prison. Veronica and the judge suggest that he reconsider his decision, to which he replies that he already has. As a result, he's sentenced to five years at Fox River State Penitentiary, a maximum security prison. Here, we learn that Michael staged this botched robbery to save his brother Lincoln Burroughs. Turns out, Lincoln has been incarcerated in the same prison for murdering the brother of the vice president, but Michael believes that he's innocent. Upon entering Fox River, Michael is approached by Captain Brad Bellick, an arrogant officer. He is then sent to a cell where he befriends his cellmate, Fernando Sucre. The following morning, the prisoners are let out into the prison yard, and Fernando gives Michael a brief tour. While wandering around, Michael takes note of the people, as well as territories around him. He then asks about his brother's whereabouts, to which Fernando points to an isolated area where he's confined. According to Fernando, the only way to get to his brother is to join penal labor operated by a mob boss, John Abruzzi. Afterwards, Michael approaches John for help, but he's rejected right away. Regardless, he calmly tells John that he has something he needs and leaves an origami crane on the table. Michael then fakes an illness and reports to the infirmary. There, he strikes a conversation with Dr. Sarah Tancredi, a high-ranking official in the hospital. She gives him his insulin shot as Michael claims to have type 1 diabetes. While she's distracted, he hurriedly flushes down another origami crane into the drain, probably to study the prison's layout. Later on, Michael meets his brother at the prison chapel and promises to get him out of here. Lincoln claims that it's impossible, but Michael replies, not if you design the place. The following day, Michael is summoned by the prison warden, Henry Pope, to his office. Knowing that Michael is a structural engineer, the warden asks him to complete an unfinished Taj Mahal model for his wife. However, Michael, who is already busy with his own mission, refuses to do so without thinking of its consequences. Later that day, one of John's goons calls him from outside to relay crucial information. He has received an origami with a picture of Otto Fibonacci, the informant who put John in prison. Upon learning this, John confronts Michael in the yard and demands everything he knows. The latter agrees, only if he's allowed to sign up to penal labor. Enraged by his resistance, John has his men beat him up, but the situation is soon calmed by the prison guards. In the aftermath, Michael is reported to the warden, who threatens to send him to the isolated compartment for fighting, but Michael manages to wriggle out of the situation by offering to help fix the Taj Mahal. In the next scene, he receives a visit by Veronica, who still tries to dissuade him from the prison life. However, Michael asserts that he knows what he's doing. Before they depart, they share a hug, during which Michael whispers in her ears that someone's trying to kill Lincoln. On the other hand, we are introduced to Bishop McMorrow, who has been campaigning against Lincoln's execution. One evening, he's visited by some Secret Service agents who threaten him to stop his campaign. The bishop refuses to budge, but this costs him his life as he's murdered the same night. Back in prison, Michael again reports to the infirmary for his regular checkup. This time, Sarah notices his unusually low glucose level and tells him that he's reacting to the insulin as if he's not diabetic. As a result, she decides to run a test on his next visit. In an attempt to keep up his bluff, Michael later approaches the prison pharmacist, C-Note, and pays him in advance to get an insulin blocker. Later, while staying inside his prison cell, Michael receives an ID card for penal labor sent by John. Starting from this point, he begins to study the prison layout in even more detail while carrying out the labor work. One day, after his work shift, Michael meets Lincoln, who is perplexed as to how they're going to break out of the prison. Intrigued, Lincoln asks if he's seen the blueprints to the prison, to which Michael replies, I've got them on me. He then reveals his body tattoo, which is a series of geometric patterns that disguise the blueprints to Fox River. Good thing the guards didn't strip him and see this when he first entered, which is what happens in every other prison story known to man. The next day, Michael carefully examines one of his tattoos, bearing the name Alan Schweitzer. At the same time, Fernando notices that their toilet won't flush, which means that there's a shakedown inside the prison. Alerted by this, he asks Michael to get rid of a shank hidden under the table, but before he can do so, Captain Brad sees him and seizes the contraband from his hand. Just then, Henry shows up and asks if the shank belongs to Michael. The latter remains silent, which makes the warden realize that the weapon belongs to Fernando. So, Henry sends Fernando to solitary confinement, after which he orders the captain to call off the search. Sometime later, in the chapel, Michael talks to his brother, who inquires about the update in their escape plan. Michael then explains that the infirmary 
is the weakest spot in the prison's security chain, and as long as Sarah believes he's diabetic, they have enough time to work on their plan. After a brief conversation, Michael heads to the yard, where he starts looking through the benches to find a loose bolt. As soon as he locates one, he sits down and begins to loosen the bolt. Shortly after, he's approached by a notorious inmate, Teabag, who claims that the benches belong to him. He doesn't want Michael on the bleachers unless he will join in the racist battle between the whites and blacks. Michael promptly declines, so he's hustled away before he can finish unscrewing the bolt. Outside the prison, Veronica is trying to delve deeper into Lincoln's case. She meets with a lawyer who once represented him and asks about the case. The lawyer asserts that Lincoln is guilty, as the murder weapon was found in his house. He also hands her a hard disk with CCTV footage showing Lincoln shooting down the president's brother in the parking lot. That's pretty hard evidence. In the meantime, Lincoln is in his cell, reminiscing the romantic moments he spent with Veronica, revealing that they were a couple. The next day, Michael goes back to the bench to unscrew the bolt again, only to be caught by Teabag. Believing that he was about to use it to attack him, the notorious guy takes the bolt from Michael and walks away. Since the bolt is crucial for his plan, Michael agrees to join him in the fight against the black inmates. Unfortunately, C-Note overhears their conversation and confronts him later. Believing that he's siding up with the whites, C-Note refuses to give him the insulin-blocking pills. When you were just a criminal, it was fine, but a racist criminal? Get out of here. On the other hand, Lincoln receives a visit by Veronica, who is now convinced that he's a murderer. However, he maintains his innocence, claiming that he never pulled the trigger and that the guy was already dead in the car. He tries to explain that he has been framed, but Veronica remains skeptical and tells him not to let Michael suffer because of his deed. Elsewhere, Lincoln's lawyer, all right, all right, all right, is approached by the two Secret Service agents, Paul and Danny, who ask him why he made a fake CCTV footage. The lawyer admits that he did it to prove to Veronica that Lincoln is guilty. The agents then demand more information about Veronica, so the lawyer reveals everything thing he knows. Meanwhile, Veronica goes to visit the mother of Crab Simmons, who is believed to be the one who framed Lincoln. The mother, Leticia, then discloses how the Secret Service framed Lincoln using her son. Unbeknownst to them, Paul and Danny are watching them from a distance. Later, Paul calls the vice president to inform her about Veronica, who is trying to prove Lincoln's innocence. In response, she tells him to do whatever he needs to get her out of their way. Back in the prison, all the prisoners are instructed to emerge from their cells for a headcount. During this, a prisoner steps out of line, causing a fight to break out between white and black inmates. Amidst the commotion, Michael decides to get the bolt back from Teabag's cellmate Jason, so he gets into a scuffle with him. When C-Note sees this, he sends some of his men to assist Michael. After a bit of struggle, Michael manages to grab the bolt from Jason, but not long after, the black inmates stab Jason several times and leave him to die in Michael's arms. When Teabag sees this, he thinks that Michael killed him, fueling him with anger. But before he can react, the guards throw a smoke bomb forcing the prisoners to retreat back to their cells. But how can they see them? In the aftermath, the warden places the prisoners on a 48-hour lockdown as a punishment for their violence. Once he leaves, Michael starts to rub the screw against the floor, until its end forms a hexagon-shaped makeshift key. Once done, he uses it to unscrew his cell's toilet from the wall. After lockdown, Michael finally receives the insulin blocker from C-Note, which he consumes before going for his regular checkup. This allows him to evade Sarah's suspicion, proving that he's diabetic. As he walks out of the infirmary, he's escorted by a guard to John, who demands Otto's whereabouts. When Michael refuses to answer, John cuts two of his toes to make him talk. Fortunately, before he can cause more damage, a guard walks in and sends the bad guys away. Michael is then rushed to the infirmary, where Sarah begins to tend to his wounds. After the treatment, she demands to know what happened, but neither Michael nor the prison guard disclose anything to her. Later on, when Lincoln finds out about this incident, he vows to make John pay for it. However, Michael forbids him from doing anything reminding him that they need John for their escape. Furthermore, he also emphasizes the need to involve Fernando in their mission, because being a cellmate, it's impossible to dig the cell without his knowing. Later, Michael comes up with a plan to check Fernando's loyalty. During penal labor, he takes out a cell phone in front of him and hides it in a circuit box. On the other hand, Teabag approaches one of his fellow inmates, who works as a welder. He asks him for a knife that would inflict hours of suffering until death. Hiding from the camera, the inmate shows him a knife, which he claims will hook the intestines, and then kill the person by infection. Impressed, Teabag takes it, intending to use it on Michael and avenge his cellmate's death. I'ma go stab a stab stab on him. Elsewhere, Veronica goes to visit Leticia one more time to extract more information on Lincoln's case, but as soon as she enters the apartment, Leticia holds her at gunpoint, suspecting that she works for the Secret Service. She asserts that the only reason she's still breathing is that she hasn't testified Lincoln's hearing yet. Veronica tries to persuade her to divulge everything she knows, reassuring
reassuring that she'll protect her from the Secret Service agents. When Leticia agrees, Veronica takes her to her office and records all the details regarding Lincoln's case, including how her son was set up upon confiding everything. Leticia walks out to smoke, and moments later, Veronica is visited by Paul. He offers to help her in the case, pretending to be on her side, but she doesn't trust him at all. As soon as he leaves, Veronica is concerned about Leticia and rushes in search of her. She enters the smoking room, but only finds a lit cigarette. In the prison, Lincoln notices Fernando talking with the other prisoners about a potential cell phone. He then tips off the captain about Fernando possessing a phone in exchange for a couple of days outside his cell. Acting on this tip, Captain Brad interrogates Fernando, but the latter doesn't utter a word, ultimately proving that he's loyal. As Fernando returns back to work, Michael shows him that the phone was fake, admitting that he was only testing his loyalty. He then reveals his escape plan and offers him to join in. However, Fernando claims that he doesn't want to break out because his release date is just 16 months away. He fears that if they get caught, their sentence will extend by 10 years, a risk which he clearly won't be taking. He also threatens to expose Michael if they take any steps in front of him. Why didn't he sell him out on the phone then? In the next scene, Michael walks back to his cell, only to see Fernando packing up his stuff. He is about to relocate to a new cell. Michael begs him not to leave, but the latter doesn't want to get involved in their escape plan. Afterwards, John takes Teabag to a room and beats him up in front of Michael. He is doing so to gain the trust of the new prisoner. Because of this, Michael finally agrees to disclose about Otto, but under the condition that John arranges a plan for his escape. Later, as Michael is unscrewing the toilet in his room, Captain Brad arrives with a new cellmate. He is Charles Potoshik from the psychiatric ward. Subsequently, Michael tells his brother about Potoshik, a major intervention in their escape plan. The brothers then discuss an alternative way to carry out their plan, with Michael deciding to dig the cell while Potoshik is asleep. However, their plan turns out to be a complete failure because Potoshik has a neurological condition due to which he doesn't sleep at all. On the other hand, Paul and Danny drive to an abandoned part of the woods and take out Leticia from their car trunk. Paul then instructs Danny to execute her while he decides to keep watch. Heeding to his instruction, Danny takes her deeper into the forest and guns her down mercilessly. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.